اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الرحمن الرحیم مالک یوم الدین ایا کا نہ ابود و ایا کا نستعین احدین سرات المستقیم سرات الزین انمتا علیہم غیر المغدوب علیہم ولدالین آمین In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, Dr. William Campbell, Dr. Zakir Naik, Dr. Mazakis, Dr. Jamal Badawi, Dr. Samuel Nauman, and Mr. Sam Shamoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessings of Almighty Allah be upon all of you. On behalf of the organizers, the Islamic Circle of North America, I, Sayyid Sabil Ahmed, welcome all of you to this unique event, a dialogue on the topic, the Quran, the Bible, and the light of science. Again, on behalf of Dr. Campbell, Dr. Zakir Naik, Islamic Circle of North America, this dialogue is being held in a spirit of friendship, understanding each other's viewpoints. A brief introduction of ICNAS activities, Islamic Circle of North America. The goals of Islamic Circle of North America are to motivate Muslims to perform their duty of being witnesses unto mankind, offering educational training opportunities to increase the Islamic knowledge and to enhance the character. ICNA is also active in opposing immorality and oppression of all forms, supporting efforts for socio-economic justice, civil liberties in the society, strengthening the bond of humanity by serving all those in need anywhere in the world, with special focus on our neighborhood across North America. For today's unique dialogue, the two main moderators are Dr. Muhammad Naik, representing Dr. Zakir Naik, and Dr. Samuel Nauman, representing Dr. William Campbell. It is my duty to ensure a fair and proper conduct of this meeting. Therefore, we request our speakers as well as the audience to maintain due decorum for a healthy dialogue. With that, I would request Dr. Samuel Nauman to give the introduction of Dr. William Campbell. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Brother Sabil Ahmed. It's a pleasure and honor to be here with you this evening. And uh, first of all, I myself, with a group of our uh, brothers and sisters from the Christian background, really like to thank the Islamic Circle of North America and uh, the local people who have organized this unique event. They have done a great job. They have worked very hard. And now we have come to the last moment to be here. Dr. William Campbell did his medical work in Cleveland, Ohio, at Case Western Reserve University. He worked for 20 years in Morocco, where he learned Arabic. After seven years in Tunisia, he wrote his book, Answering Dr. Maurice Bukhais. He is a convinced Christian who likes to explain the Injil or the Gospel to everyone. At age 74, Dr. Campbell is retired with 10 grandchildren. And we are really thankful and we are really happy to be here with you tonight. Thank you. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, am pleased to be amongst you all along with Dr. Zakir. It's a pleasure to be here for this unique event and have the good pleasure of having scholars like Dr. William Campbell, Dr. Jamal Badawi, Dr. Mazakas, as well as my co-colleague, 
Brother Dr. Samuel Naman, you're with us. I, on behalf of Brother Samuel and myself, present the format for the dialogue. The format, as agreed and decided fair by both our speakers, is Dr. William Campbell would first address you for 55 minutes on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science. Then Dr. Zakir Naik, at the far end, would make his presentation for 55 minutes on the same topic. This would be followed by a response session in which Dr. Campbell would respond to the matter presented by Dr. Zakir for 25 minutes, followed by Dr. Zakir too responding for 25 minutes to the matter presented by Dr. Campbell. Lastly, we would have the open question and answer session in which the audience may pose questions to each speaker alternately on the question mics provided in the auditorium. After the mics questions are handled, we would allow questions on index cards to be provided by volunteers in the aisles and in the order selected at random by the coordinators and the advisors to each of the speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, to address you today, Dr. William Campbell. <laughs> Greetings to Dr. Knight, who came, almost surely came the farthest. Greeting to Sabil Ahmed and Mohammed Knight, and greeting to the organizing committee Calling this the ultimate dialogue is a bit of an exaggeration, but it is good advertising. And greetings to you, the audience. I'd like to also bring greetings in the name of Yahweh, or better known as Jehovah, the great creator God who loves us. I wish to start by speaking about words. Tonight we are going to speak about the words of the Bible and the words of the Koran. The scholars of modern linguistics tell us a word, a phrase, or a sentence means what it meant to the speaker and the person or crowd of people listening. In the case of the Koran, what it meant to Mohammed and the, those listening to it. In the case of the Bible, what it meant to Moses or Jesus or those listening to them. To check this, we have the context of all the usages in the Bible or the Koran. In addition, there is the poetry and letters of that century. For the Gospel, the first century A.D. For the Koran, the first century of the Hazra. If we are going to follow the truth, we may not make up new meanings. If we are seriously after truth, there are no permissible lies. Here is an example of what I am talking about. You can have the first slide here. This is talking about two dictionaries that I have in my home, one from 1951 and 1991. In these two dictionaries, the first meaning, pig, a young swine of either sex, is the same. The second meaning, any swine or hog, any wild or domestic swine, it's the same. Third, the flesh of swine pork is the same. Then the, the meaning of person or animal of piggish habits, it's the same. A person who is gluttonous. And down here, pouring metal into a pig for pig iron is the same. But over here is a new meaning, a police officer. We need to call the police officers pigs. All right, the question is, in the Torah, it says you can't eat pigs. Well, can I turn around and say, oh, yes, that means police officers. You can't eat police officers. Of course not. In the Koran, Allah says can't eat pigs. Can I translate it, can't eat put police officers? No. It's wrong. It would be stupid. It would be lying, actually. Mohammed did not mean police officers. Moses did not mean police officers. 
We may not have any new meanings. We must use the meanings known in the first century A.D. for the Bible, or that is, for the Gospel, and the first century of the Hajra for the Koran. Now let us look at what the Koran is going, says about embryology. Oh, sorry, got the wrong thing. It has been said that the idea of the embryo developing through stages is a modern one, and that the Koran is anticipating modern embryology by depicting differing stages. In a pamphlet entitled Highlights of Human Embryology by Keith Moore, Dr. Moore claims the realization that the embryo develops in stages in the uterus was not discussed or illustrated until the 15th century. We will weigh this claim by considering the meaning of the Arabic words used by the Koran, and secondly, by examining the historical situation leading up to and surrounding the Koran. We will start by looking at the main words using the word alaka, main verses. The Arabic word alaka in the singular, or alak as the collective plural, is used six times. In the Surah of the Resurrection, al qiyamah 75, 35 to 39, we read, Was he man, not a drop of sperm ejaculated? Then he became alaka, and God shaped and formed and made of him a pair, the male and the female. In the Surah of the Believer, al Mutman, 4067, it says, He it is who created you from dust, then from a sperm drop, then from a leech-like clot, alaka, then brings you forth as a child that perhaps you may understand. In the Surah of the Pilgrimage, Al-Hajj 22.5, it says, O mankind, if you have doubt about the resurrection, consider that we have created you from dust, then from a drop of seed, then from a clot, alaka, then from a little lump of flesh, shapely and shapeless. And finally, the fullest treatment is in the Surah of the Believers, Al-Mu'minun 23.12-14, which reads, Verily, we created man from a product of wet earth, then placed him as a drop of seed in a safe lodging. Then we fashioned the drop of clot, alaka, and of the clot we fashioned a lump, and of the lump we fashioned bones, and we clothed the bones with meat. Then we produced it as another creation. And here you have the stages according to the Koran. Nutfa sperm, alaka clot. Mudaga, piece of meat. Adam, bones. And the fifth stage, dressing the bones with muscles. Over the last hundred plus years, this word alaka has been translated as follows. There's ten translations here. I'm not going to read them all. Three are in French, where it says un gomo de sang, or a clot of blood. Three versions, five versions are English, where it's either clot or leech-like clot. One version is in Indonesian, at the bottom there, sigampaldara, lump of or clot of blood. And the last one is Farsi, basta, a clot of blood. As every reader who has studied human reproduction will realize, there is no stage as a clot during the formation of a fetus. So this, so this is a very major scientific problem. In the dictionaries of Wur and Abdenor, the only meanings given for alaka in this feminine singular are clot and leech. And in North Africa, both of these meanings are still used. Many patients have come to me to ask for a clot to be removed from their throat. And many women have come to me and told me their period didn't come. When I say, I'm sorry, I can't give you medicine to bring your period because I believe that's a baby, they would say, Mazel Dim, it's still blood. So they were understanding these ideas of the Koran. Lastly, we must consider the first verses which came to Muhammad in Mecca. These are found in the 96th surah called Allah, clots, from the very word that we're studying. In 96.1.2 we read, proclaim. In the name of your Lord who created, created man from Allah. Here the word is in the collective plural. This form of the word can have other meanings because Allah is also the derived verbal noun of the verb alika. The verbal noun usually corresponds to the gerund in English, as in the sentence, swimming is fun. 
Therefore, we could expect it to mean hanging or clinging or adhering. But the ten translators listed above have all used clot or congealed blood in this verse, too. In spite of the number and qualifications of these translators who use the word clot, the French doctor Maurice Bucay has sharp words for them. He writes, What is more likely to mislead the inquiring reader is once again the problem of vocabulary. The majority of translations describe, for example, man's formation from a blood clot. A statement of this kind is totally unacceptable to scientists specializing in the field. This shows how great the importance of an association between linguistic and scientific knowledge is when it comes to grasping the meaning of Quranic statements on reproduction. Put in other words, Bukai is saying, Nobody has translated the Koran correctly until I, Dr. Bukai, came along. How does Dr. Bukai think that it should be translated? He proposes that instead of clot, the word alaka should be translated as something which clings, which would refer to the fetus being attached to the uterus through the placenta. But as all you ladies who've been pregnant know, the thing which clings doesn't stop its clinging to become chewed meat. It keeps on being in the thing which clings, which is attached by the placenta for eight and a half months. Thirdly, these verses say that the chewed meat becomes bones, and then the bones are covered with muscle. They give the impression that first the skeleton is formed, and then it is clothed with flesh. And Dr. Bukai knows perfectly well that this is not true. The muscles and the cartilage precursors of the bones start forming from the somite at the same time. At the end of the eighth week, there are only a few centers of ossification started, but the fetus is already able to make muscular movement. In a personal letter from Dr. T.W. Sadler, who's associate professor in, embry in anatomy and the author of Langman's Medical Embryology, Dr. Stad Sadler states, at the eighth week post-fertilization, the ribs would be cartilaginous, not bone, and muscles would be present. Also, at this time, ossification would just begin. Muscles would be capable of some movement at eight weeks. It's always better to have two witnesses, so we shall see what Dr. Keith Moore has to say about the development of bones and muscles in his book, The De Developing Human. Extracted from chapters 15 and 17, we find the following information. The skeletal, skeletal system develops from mesoderm. The limb muscles develop in the limb buds that are derived from this somatic mesoderm. We see that here on this slide. It's difficult perhaps to see, but there's the limb bud. And then here there's just a little bit of cartilage with the muscles around. Here there's more cartilage. And this is the whole, but the bones are formed and in the form of bones, but it's all cartilage. No bones yet. This second slide shows how it forms. Here's, a, here's the cartilage, though. Just the bone is, looks like cart, cartilage. And then it starts to have some calcium deposited. And then it starts to have ossification and bone form. As the bone models form, sorry. I want to go back to this. As the bone models form, Myoblasts develop a large muscle mass in each limb bud, separating into extensor and flexor muscles. In other words, the limb muscles develop simultaneously from the mesenchyme surrounding the developing bones. So there's the cartilage, and here are the muscles developing around the cartilage. During a personal conversation with Dr. Moore, I showed him Dr. Sadler's statement, and he agreed that it was absolutely valid. Conclusion. Dr. Sadler and Dr. Moore agree. There is no time when calcified bones have been formed and then the muscles are placed around them. The muscles are there several weeks before there are calcified bones, rather than being added around previously formed bones as the Koran states. The Koran is in complete error here. The problems are far from being solved. Let us fully return to Alaka. Dr. Moore also has a suggestion. 
He says another verse in the Koran refers to the leech-like appearance and the chewed-like stages of human development. From this definition, Dr. Moore has gone ahead to propose that a 23-day 23 day embryo, 3 millimeters long, that's an eighth of an inch. I can hardly put my fingers that close together without touching. This is Carnegie Stage 10, shown on the inside cover of Moore's book. This is the beginning. And here's the sperm entering the egg. So that's stage one. Comes down here to stage six in the second week. And here's the third week. And there's, it's, there's stage 10, and here is day 23. And this is what Dr. Moore wants to say looks like a leech. If we could look further, though, and look at the x-ray, here's day 22, and the ball backbone is still open. And when we look at day 23, the backbone is open there, and it's open there, and the head is wide open. It doesn't look like a leech at all. And if you keep on, and this, this is a... Diagram of it, the head is open, they're not rostral neuropore. And finally, this diagram shows there's the, there is the 20-day the embryo. It's got a yolk sac, it's got an umbilicus, it doesn't look like a leech at all. The problem, the great problem with these new definitions for the word alaka is that no confirming examples have been provided from the Arab, Arabic use in the centuries surrounding the Hazra. The only way to establish the meaning of the word is by usage. The only way to establish whether the singular form alaka can mean a three millimeter embryo or the thing that clings is to bring sentences demonstrating this usage from the literature of the Arabs of Mecca and Medina close to the time of Mohammed, especially from the language of the Quraysh. This will not be an easy task because much work has already been done on the clear Arabic of the Quraysh. The early Muslims understood intuitively the need to know exactly what the Quranic words mean. And for this reason, they made comprehensive studies of their language and poetry. Hamza Boubacar, former rector of the main mosque in Paris, brought up this subject at a conference on the One God in Montpellier in 1985. He posed the question to the audience, has the comprehension of the text of the Koran known at the time of Mohammed remains stable? And his answer was, ancient poetry shows that it has. We can only, only conclude, if the verses which bring spiritual comfort and hope to Muslims have remained stable, then the scientific statements embedded in those verses must also be accepted as stable, unless new evidence can be brought forward. This is especially important since some of the verses say that this information is a sign. The Surah of the Believer, as we saw above, says he, is, he it is who created you from dust, then from a sperm drop, then from a clot, alaka, that perhaps you may understand. And in the Surah of the Pilgrimage, he said, O mankind, if you have doubt about the resurrection, consider. Therefore, the question must be asked. asked if it was a clear sign to the men and women of Mecca and Medina, what did they understand from the word alaka, which would lead them to faith in the resurrection? The answer. We are going to examine the historical situation leading up to the time of Mohammed to see what Mohammed and his people believed about embryology. We will start with Hippocrates. According to the best evidence, he was born on the Greek island of Kos in 460 B.C. And he has stages. His stages are as follows. The sperm is a product which comes from the whole body of each parent. Weak sperm coming from the weak parts and strong sperm from the strong parts. Then he goes ahead and talks about the coagulation of the mother's blood. The seed embryo then is contained in the membrane. Moreover, it grows because of its mother's blood, which descends to the womb. For once a woman conceives, she ceases to menstruate. Then about flesh. 
He says at this stage, with the descent and coagulation of the mother's blood, flesh begins to form with the, be formed with the umbilicus. And lastly, bones. He says as the flesh grows, it is formed into distinct members by breath. The bones grow hard like a, and send out branches like a tree. Next, we will look at Aristotle. In his book on the generation of animals, sometime about 350 B.C., he gives his stages of embryology. And he talks about first semen and menstrual blood, or catamenia. In this section, Aristotle speaks of the male semen as being in a pure state. It follows that what the female would contribute to the semen of the male would be material for the semen to work on. In other words, the semen clots the menstrual blood. Then he goes to flesh. He says, nature forms this from the purest material, the flesh. And from the residue thereof, it forms bones. And lastly, around the flesh, around the bones, and attached to them by thin fibrous bands, grow the fleshly parts. Clearly, the Koran follows this exactly. Sperm clotting the menstrual blood, which forms meat, then the bones are formed, and lastly, around about the bones, grow the fleshly parts. Next, we will consider Indian medicine. The, in, the opinion of Sharaka in 123 A.D. and Susruta is that both the male and female contributed seed. The secretion of the male is called the sukra, semen. The secretion of the woman is called artava, or sanita, blood. And it is derived from the blood by way of food, by way of blood. Here we see that in the medicine of India, they too had the idea that the child was formed from semen and blood.